Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for a demonstration of the Reason Foundation's uh, education finance modeling tool. I am Jim Smith. I am Chief Strategy Officer at the Platt Institute. We're also joined today by Jim Vogel, who is the CEO of the Platt Institute. It's a common belief that Nebraska's K-12 system is a key factor, if not the key factor to the economic competitiveness and growth of the state of Nebraska. However, securing a strong statewide education system requires a sustainable and balanced source of funding and a fair and equitable distribution of state funds. While a sustainable and balanced source of funding might include the modernization of our tax code and increasing state aid to education as an offset to local property taxes, the fair and equitable distribution of state funds can only be achieved by updating or replacing the outdated TOSA model. We understand these are weighty challenges, and this is why the Platt Institute partnered with the Reason Foundation. We partnered to create an education finance modeling tool to help policymakers and education leaders explore and evaluate potential reforms to Nebraska's funding system. We hope you will find this webinar helpful and that you will see benefit in using this tool. I would now like to introduce Michael Lucci, Senior Policy Advisor at the Platt Institute for his remarks and further introductions. Uh, Michael, it's all yours. Thank you, Jim. Jim, are you able to hear me? I am. Perfect. My name is Michael Lucci. As Jim mentioned, I'm the Senior Policy Advisor with Platt Institute. I focus a lot on fiscal and tax policy. So obviously the school funding formula and in particular property taxes are a part of the big fiscal issues within Nebraska. Um, I'm joined today by Christian who is going to also do a quick introduction of himself. Uh, and he's coming to us from the Reason Foundation. Great, thank you, Michael. And can you hear me? I guess I'll bounce the question over to you. Great. Yep. Uh, hi, my name is Christian Bernard. I'm a, a senior policy analyst with Reason Foundation. Um, I specialize in state school finance systems um, with the goal of making them uh, fairer, um, more uh, less complex um, and portable. So wherever students move, dollars seamlessly follow them. And I'm excited to talk about Nebraska school finance system. So thank you, Michael. Awesome. Uh, so as I was saying, Nebraskans generally agree that a part of the solution to the property tax issue is finding a way to change the school funding formula, that a big driver of property taxes is the need to finance the schools. And so that's what we want to get into today. Um, and the way we're going to talk about this is by looking at a tool that Reason's put together and, and really, it's something to think of as a tool where the user can choose their preferences and their inputs and use this tool to see what that will do to the allocation of funds to, di to districts across the state. Um, and so it's, it's less of a tool of saying, this is what you ought to do. And it's more of a tool of saying, these are the outputs that you'll get with the inputs that you're going to put into it. Um, but before we do that, we're going to have a little bit of a conversation with Christian about the current uh, formula that Nebraska uses, the Tiosa formula, and we'll talk a little bit about how like property taxes play into uh, this conversation, and then we'll have time to get into specifics and questions at the end. Um, but with that, we're, we're going to start with Christian, who's going to walk us through a couple slides that talk about the Tiosa formula. Um, Reason Foundation's kind of perspective of what's good and what's bad in a formula as such. And then we'll talk a little bit about examples of states that have done some reforms that are at least along the lines of what Nebraska is considering. So Christian, I'll let you share um, your screen. All right. I, I actually, I just need to be made host again, Michael, just so I can share my screen. <laughs> 
well, why don't, so we're going to have that changed over to you. Why don't we, why don't you talk a little bit about reasons philosophy and its approach to looking at school funding formulas? What are you looking for? What's good in a formula? What's not going to formula? And then we'll get into the Teosa conversation from there. Great. Yes. Thank you, Michael. Uh, so the, we are a 501c3 nonprofit think tank. Um, oh, great. And uh, now I can share my screen. Okay. Sorry. Sorry for the delay, everybody. How does that look? Thumbs up. Great. Okay. So um, what we're going to be eventually getting into is, is, demoing a modeling tool of Nebraska school finance system. As, and as Michael mentioned, what it allows you to do is simulate a pretty wide range of changes to the funding system and see how that would affect districts compared to how they're currently receiving funding. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So I already introduced myself. My name is Christian Bernard. I'm a senior policy analyst with the Reason Foundation. Um, quickly, as Michael was just asking, so our goals we're a 501c3 nonprofit think tank, and we provide uh, pro bono research, data, legislative support for any states that are interested in uh, improving their school finance systems. And the direction we generally um, promote is based on these uh, four principles here. So first is fairness. Uh, we want another word for this is equity. We want dollars to be based on individual students and their needs. We don't want it to be based on property wealth, uh, where they live, um, whether the state formula favors their district for arbitrary reasons or not. We want dollars to be allocated fairly based on individual students. Portability is another key, uh, key principle for us. So when students change schools, we want dollars to be able to follow them seamlessly. And to whatever extent that funding formulas don't allow that, uh, we'll often recommend changes. Transparency, we want uh, formulas and state funding systems to be easy to understand. We don't want it where only a few stakeholders really can make heads or tails uh, out of why dollars are making it to specific districts and in specific ways. We want a broad range of stakeholders to be able to understand why the funding formula works the way that it does um, so that they can evaluate how it's, how it's serving students. And then finally, flexibility is the fourth principle. Uh, we believe that those closest to the children are the ones who are best uh, situated to know what those students need. So we want the local policymakers to be as empowered as possible to tailor educational services uh, to fit the unique needs of their local students. So just quick background on Nebraska's funding system, uh, the TIOSA formula. Um, I, I'm not going to be able to give a comprehensive overview of how TIOSA works, but I do want to just give you a little bit of context so when we start exploring the actual tool, um, you have some framework uh, whereby you can understand what, what we're doing there. So step one is on the left. So the way TIOSA works is it looks at school districts. Um, it, it considers factors such as their, their enrollment, um, student need categories such as concentrations of poverty or English learners, um, and then it also there are some special education or uh, other kinds of spending categories as reimbursement uh, from the state for qualifying expenditures spent on certain categories of or certain kinds of services. And then there are some other categories. So this step one, the idea is that the state determines kind of a district amount that this district is entitled to to serve their students in the public schools. Step two. Um, districts, uh, the state determines the available resources a district has to cover that step one amount. I've highlighted local property tax because that is far and away the biggest source uh, for districts to cover that step one revenue entitlement. Uh, but also there are other sources that are factored into uh, district resources. That would include net option funding, which is funding that follows open enrollment students or students moving across district boundaries. There's also a, other, uh, a couple other dedicated revenues and uh, state uh, funding streams that are factored into a district's already existing resources. And now finally, step three, what happens is that the state evaluates whether the resources in step two, 
cover a district's full revenue entitlement? If the answer is no, then the state tops off uh, a district's resources with state equalization aid. And what that does is that it ensures that every school district gets the calculated needs from step one. I'll also say that the state assumes that each district in Nebraska taxes at $1 per $100 of adjusted valuation in that school district. And so this is not a requirement for school districts, but the state does assume that that $1 local effort rate is going to be part of a district's resources. And we're gonna see that um, this is not actually um, the rate that a lot of the school districts in Nebraska tax at uh, for a couple different reasons. Um, so now that I've explained the principles that we kind of use to evaluate uh, state finance systems, and I've described a little bit very briefly about how TIOSA works, um, a couple of strengths I want to highlight is that most state funding is in the funding formula. I appreciate that when we go to different states, uh, often there will be a funding formula as well as other grants outside of that funding formula for various reasons or, or, or ad hoc purposes. A uh, strength in Nebraska is that a lot of your state, almost all of your state funding is in the uh, statewide uh, TIOSA formula, uh, which is, that's definitely a strength. Uh, also, the formula accounts for various student need categories um, like special education, concentrations of poverty, English learners. Um, this is not something we take for granted. Uh, not every state um, even factors in these various uh, categories of, uh, of need for students. And so that's another thing I, we would count in favor uh, for, for Nebraska's TIOSA formula because it goes along with our principle of fairness. Um, now to the the weaknesses, um, I didn't explain this very much when I was uh, very briefly summarizing how TIOSA works, but the formula calculations vary by district. Districts are placed into comparison groups so that their base amounts that they're getting for general education students or various student need categories um, vary district by district. This undermines the transparency and simplicity of the funding system, and it's hard to always understand why each district is getting exactly what it's getting. Uh, secondly, Nebraska ranks third in the nation in its dependence on local taxes for K through 12. Uh, based on federal data from the most recently available year, it's about 59.5% of Nebraska's K through 12 education funding comes from local taxes, and that's almost exclusively property taxes in, in Nebraska's case. It only ranks behind the District of Columbia and New Hampshire. Um, for us, what this does is it can, it very much uh, makes Nebraska's school finance system and how much, how many resources districts are getting, it makes that depend on the property wealth of the district. And it's not based on individual student needs. Uh, and finally, uh, this is a problem I would say is um, unique to Nebraska is that only 35% of the state's school districts qualified for state equalization aid for uh, this school year. What that means is that school districts in Nebraska, if you remember when I was going through the TIOSA calculations, um, most of them to about two thirds, when you get to the resources step, property taxes, as well as those other more minor um, funding streams cover at least that step one needs calculation. And so that there is no need for state equalization aid. Now, in most cases, districts are getting well above what the state calculation for needs is. What this means is that the state funding formula is almost irrelevant to about two thirds of Nebraska's districts. Now, a lot of these dist districts are rural and combined, I think they only serve a, about a third of the state's students, but that's still a huge portion of Nebraska's students who where any changes to the funding formula usually are not relevant to them because of how much they're raising from local property taxes. Finally, one other weakness I'll cover is that the local effort rates at districts in Nebraska vary substantially. If you'll remember, I was talking about how the $1 per $100 of adjusted valuation is assumed in the formula, but not required. Here is, the, here is a range of rates that the school districts in Nebraska are actually at. So, Going back to the $1 point, maybe you can see my cursor here. 
only 28 districts in Nebraska are between a dollar. The, the, uh, the funding system allows districts to go a little bit above that dollar without needing voter approval. A small minority of districts are actually at that $1 rate. It's the districts in this slice of the pie, and then 11 more are above $1.05. And this is data from the 2021-2022 school year. But the rest of Nebraska's districts are below that dollar, and they're in different ranges. So what's happening here is that because of how much, uh, how much property taxes dominate the school finance system, a lot of districts don't even need to go to a dollar to cover over and above their formula needs amount. OK, so what can be done about this? Uh, the main issue in Nebraska, and we're going to con continue discussing this, is the property tax reliance of the system. And the question is always, okay, so what other sources of revenue could we pivot to to make the system more streamlined and, and student-centered and to implement some uh, sensible restrictions on property taxation? Well, in 2008, Indiana, um, due to kind of a groundswell of voter frustration over unpredictable and rising property tax rates uh, passed Public Law 146, which replaced all local operat operating revenue in the state finance system with state revenue. To this day, Indiana's school finance system is exclusively state funded. So in this reform, just a couple highlights, uh, the state support grew from 3.8 billion to 6.3 billion, the local share of total revenue fell substantially, and the reform was also supplemented by some property tax caps um, and some caps on bond issuances and requiring voter approval for uh, property taxes um, to, uh, for school operations. A couple other notable facts, it was a bipartisan reform and the way property taxes were, so decreasing the reliance on property taxes, it didn't just leave a gap uh, where districts were all of a sudden not getting that money anymore. What happened was the, the state increased the uh, sales tax from 6% to 7% and then repurposed existing property tax relief funds um, that had been previously kind of putting a Band-Aid on the issue of property taxation in Indiana. Um, and then there was also transition funding for, the, for some districts that were uh, going to lose uh, revenues under the, the funding reform. And Christian, do you mind if I cut in just for a second yes. here? I want to uh, make very clear for the audience, as Christian is doing here, what we're showing here is Indiana as an example that has done reforms. Christian will be able to rattle off a bunch of other states have done similar reforms. And it's not that we're prescribing to do what Indiana did to totally yes. take the property tax out, to raise the sales tax. It's simply to say, the states have gone down this path. Indiana is one of those states that has dealt with somewhat similar issues to Nebraska, and they dealt with it in this way. And then there are other states, and Re uh, Reason has a tons of resources on a number of other states, Tennessee, uh, California, California. Yeah. that have also dealt with uh, issues. And so in describing Indiana here, so I'm thinking of the tax side, and so I'm sensitive to tax changes in various ways. I want everybody to understand that we're describing that states have gone down this way. We're not recommending to, you know, raise rates here and lower rates here specifically in any way, but we're describing how states have navigated through this. Um, and, and as Christian uh, did mention, though, uh, the, one of the big or maybe the impetus in Indiana for changing the school funding formula was uh, folks feeling very, you know, stretched on the property tax burden itself. And, and so that's what we're trying to help bring together uh, the different parts. Obviously, the property tax burden is a big issue in Nebraska, too. And the school funding formula is something that policymakers and leaders have been looking at a lot. Yes, thank you, Michael. I really appreciate that addition. And, and it also gives me an opportunity to express that Indiana was in a little bit different of a place as Nebraska. I, I don't think it's possible at this point to completely swap out state revenues for property tax revenues in Nebraska if 60% of all your K through 12 funding, which includes federal revenue, is coming from uh, local tax sources. Um, Indiana did not have that level of reliance in their system. But this does offer a case study of how the state can take on a bigger role 
as a way to decrease uh, property tax reliance in the state. And, and I'll add too that Indiana, part of the reform is also capping uh, valuation practices and standardizing valuation practices so that there was a little bit more predictability for voters and taxpayers about what their property tax bills were going to be. Um, the outcomes in Indiana's uh, reform in 2008, which was largely a property tax reform, was not actually thought of primarily as a school finance reform, was that the uh, equity in the state's fine, uh, funding formula increased. Um, and all I can, I'm linking to uh, various different resources for, for this evidence. Uh, so you don't necessarily have to take my word for it. So a study out of Indiana University found that horizontal and vertical equity increased, meaning that uh, there was less variation in how much a general education student was generating from district to district. And then higher needs students were generating more funds um, after the reform. Uh, the funding gap between high wealth and low wealth districts closed because of the decreased reliance on property taxes. Um, also, a kind of a feature we always like to point out is that because a stable statewide amount was always following students, it made it a lot easier for students to move across district lines. Um, and then there's also some evidence on um, greater fiscal accountability and um, in, in, uh, in improvements in academic results. Okay, so let's, I don't want to delay the inevitable too, uh, too much longer, but Michael, go ahead if you had anything to, to chime in on. Sure. Um, so in Nebraska, we're thinking a lot about the trade-offs between the property tax, the school funding formula, and ways to deliver property tax relief. Of course, there have been um, changes made in the property tax code to get at relief and, and sort of to slow the increase in property taxes. So there have been credits created um, that are, are targeted to sort of reduce the burden of property taxes. There's also been uh, what we would basically call a tax cap, the truth in taxation, which is it's basically a tax cap to, so that there's at least a certain transparency process when tax levies are gonna go up beyond a certain amount. So these different tools are being leveraged to provide property tax relief. Of course, the one that Christian's gonna talk about now is how could there be changes within the funding formula that results in districts getting more money, uh, which could also get at the issue of property tax relief. Yes. Um... So I'm going to get into how to use the model, but there's also some key considerations that I kind of want to stress first and foremost. What we'll see is that any changes that you want to simulate to the state's funding system will be made in the model input panel. So when you're using this tool on your own, in the lower left corner of your screen, you'll see a model input panel, and that will allow you to make pretty a wide range of changes to the state funding formula and evaluate how those changes would impact the state's school districts. I also want to underscore an important distinction in the model, which is formula changes versus revenue changes. Now, these two things are related, but like I was saying earlier, the formula is irrelevant for about two thirds of Nebraska's school districts. So you can make changes to the funding formula, changes to the base amount, how you wait for poverty, how you factor, you know, factor in uh, how rural districts are and how their uh, funding should be adjusted based on sparsity or rurality. Um, those are formula changes, um, but those won't touch necessarily the local property tax piece or the revenue sources piece. The main lever we have for the latter group, the revenue changes, is changes to the local effort rate. The model doesn't allow us to uh, change, at least in its current form, make changes to how property values are assessed or adjusted. Um, all it does is allows us to make changes to the local effort rate and have state dollars fill in where uh, local property taxes step back. Uh, so that's an important distinction is to always keep in mind how much am I changing the formula and how much am I making changes to the overall revenue structure of Nebraska? Um, also, any new state revenues in the model are assumed to be available. And so what you'll see is when we make decreases to the local effort rate, there will be increases to state equalization aid. The model doesn't give us any insight on 
where those revenues are coming from, you know, whatever state uh, tax bases are, or appropriations or anything like that are covering the, those increases. And then finally, uh, this is something Michael was addressing earlier. Any scenarios that we have programmed into the tool are not policy recommendations. What they're intended to do is explore the functionality of the model and answer just some basic questions up front um, about how certain changes to Nebraska's school finance system uh, would impact the districts. These three model scenarios, the first one, and we'll, we'll see it more uh, concretely in a second here. The first scenario is just a property tax reform. What it's gonna do is it's gonna decrease the local effort rate from $1 to 75 cents. It's gonna make no changes to the funding formula, and we're just gonna see what the impact of that decrease in the local effort rate is. The second scenario we have is to not touch the revenue side, but to just deal with the formula. So this second scenario is going to replace um, some of the kind of more complex components of Nebraska's funding system with a single base amount for each general education student and kind of reliable weights for various needs of uh, various categories of student need. And then finally, the third scenario is gonna put the two together. Uh, I wanna stress that you can customize a lot more than these three preloaded scenarios um, are going to show, um, but this kind of gets, I think the ball rolling for any, anyone who has questions about what various reforms would do. Um, so that being said, what I'm gonna do is actually drag this over. How is that looking, Michael? Do I need to adjust the window at all? If you could make that as large as possible, the map showing Nebraska. I, I gets, it gets to a point where it's a little too stretched, but I just want to make sure. How's that looking? Yeah, I think we're getting it. Um, if it's able to be the whole screen, that might be a little bit better, but I think we can see it. Let me zoom in on the map. Well, first I'm gonna to go to the home. So just quickly, the, the data in this model is based on 2020, 2021 um, financial data. Um, we actually built this model last year, um, but we published it um, just a couple months ago. Um, but just so for an FYI um, for the audience, uh, that's the data we're using, that's the year. Um, Okay, so this is just a picture of the baseline scenario. I'll, I'll make this full screen, Michael. How does that? Great. Um, what we're looking at is just a static picture of how Nebraska's finance system is allocating funds in 2020 and 2021. What we can do is right now, it's everything is in per student terms, but you can hover over any district that you want. You can zoom in on the map you know, if, if you're interested in any specific district. Wherever you hover over, what it's gonna show you is the actual per student funding, excluding federal revenues. What the state calculates as um, the formula need under the formula, how much equalization aid that school district is receiving, and then also the local effort rate that they're taxing at. On the right here, what we're gonna see is how, what kind of the aggregate effect is on school districts of any model change. And then on the bottom right here, you'll see a summary chart uh, showing um, what the per pupil or total changes are to various categories. Right now we're looking at state equalization, but I'm gonna go to just total funding. Wait for this to load. So we'll start with the view of total funding. Now, like I said, the model input panel here allows us to demo a lot of different changes. Um, so you'll see there's a local effort rate. You can make changes with these arrows here. You can also change the basic funding from how it's currently done to a single base amount. We'll explore that a little more in a second. For poverty, for low-income students, um, we have an option to do a per student amount or a weight based on that base. For special education funding, we have a pretty simple scheme here. Um, it's just to cha change to a per student amount or a weight. Um, and then limited English proficiency funding. 
uh, it's the same thing. So going back here, what I, as I mentioned, the first scenario is just demoing what, okay, all else being equal in Nebraska, what would happen if we decreased the assumed local effort rate to 75 cents, whereas it's at a dollar right now in Nebraska? To go over 75 cents or in more than five cents, which is this allowable additional rate that districts can tax at without voter approval. Um, first of all, there wouldn't be equalization aid uh, that they qualify for for above 75 cents, and they would have to get a voter approval above 80 cents. So let's hit scenario one. I'm going to wait for that to load a second. Um, and also, I just want to point out that the basic funding is not changing. Poverty funding is not changing. We're just taking a look at changes to the local effort rate. So if you dropped Nebraska's local effort rate down to 75 cents, 59 districts would lose funding. 73 would actually see a gain, and that's because they would get an increase in equalization aid. This districts in this camp, it's because they were not actually taxing at a dollar um, as the state allowed prior. And so they're getting more equalization aid. Um, the average per student funding very slightly increases statewide. But what I like about this tool is you can now hover over and see what the, let's, so let's go to a, a district in, in red here. So what the, this scenario one shows is that if you dropped down to a 75 cents local effort rate, per student funding would decrease by $2,700. The formula need calculation, keep in mind, we haven't made any changes to the formula. The way the state's calculating everything stays the same, but we're looking at what would happen if we change that revenue structure. Min, uh, Minden Public Schools would go from a 91 cents local effort rate to 75 cents, uh, but they would be losing a certain amount of, uh, of funds. Um, we can go to any of the districts in green and kind of conduct the same kind of uh, analysis. We can also change the view to how, okay, okay, how would district local effort rates be impacted? So I'll, lo I'll load that view in the model here. Well, unsurprisingly, you're going to see the green means decrease. <laughs> Uh, so 156 districts see a, a decrease in their local effort rate under this scenario, and 85 see no change. Um, the statewide average local effort rate would drop from 81 cents to 70 cents. This is so, the kind of, and go ahead, Michael. I, I wanted to ask you about this because uh, you explained this to me before, and I think it's an important point. Um, you kind of explained to me that there are buckets of schools that are at such and such local effort rate, and then there are others at a higher and then a higher and so on from there. And if you could explain that, because I think that that helps make clear why the local effort rate can be lowered, and that actually doesn't um, change the actual property tax dollars in some districts. Could you, could you kind of describe those different um, categories that they're currently taxing at? Yes. So what's interesting is that if you remember from that pie chart I showed you early, earlier, a lot of districts are actually below 75 cents in their local effort rate. So when you drop this statewide local effort rate down to 75 cents, there's a lot of districts that are gray here. Let's hover over an example. Well, that's because, okay, so Valentine, their local effort rate in 2020-2021 was 66 cents. So if you drop the local effort rate, well, to them, it, it still is not covering them, if that makes sense. Now go to a, you know, any other district that's green. Um, I'm not going to try to pronounce that. Hitchcock, um, a 92 cent local effort rate was where they were at in 2020, 2021. So you're dropping their, ta their, their local effort rate down to 75 cents. If that, so some districts are getting impacted by this drop. You can go into the model input panel and put any value you want for the local effort rate. And the model is going to give you um, an estimate of how this is going to impact, which districts are actually going to be impacted. I'll also finally go to state equalization. Let's just wait for that to load. Um, unsurprisingly, when you're decreasing the local effort rate, what that naturally means is that state dollars are taking on a bigger share uh, of equalization aid. 
districts are now qualifying for more equalization aid. So unsurprisingly, under the scenario where you drop to 75 cents, what you see is the average per student uh, equalization aid goes from about $1,200 per student uh, to over $2,400 per student. We can also look at this in total terms. What I like about this is that this allows you to estimate what the potential cost would be. So you might go into the model and say, okay, if we wanted to go to X local effort rate, how much would it cost the state to make up for those decreased local property tax dollars? Well, the state equalization aid in the, the data for the year we're using was uh, 865 million about. What happened is we would actually get into about 1.25 billion in total state equalization aid. So the gap here gives you a sense for what the increase in state funding would have to be to keep the formula how it is, but to decrease property tax with the local effort rate to 75 cents. And so I want to point out, because this was like, you know, kind of telling to me the first time when we went through this together, what you basically just described is you could put an almost 400 million more into the um, formula for distribution <laughs> to districts, and you could lower the local effort rate. But by doing both of those things, if I'm hearing you correctly, there are still some just don't get touched, like their property taxes don't go down, they don't get more money. Am I hearing you correctly on that? That's right. This is the biggest challenge in Nebraska is because you have so many districts that are all over the map in their local effort rates. Um, what you have is that any kind of reform where you change the local effort rate from one standardized value to another, um, you're not necessarily going to touch every district because districts are are all over the place, like you said, Michael. And so what this tool allows you to do is kind of mix and match and see how you can start covering more districts or what you might have to what districts you might really want to keep in mind because they might not, not be touched by a, a large range of potential reforms. I also want to make a point getting into scenario two here and I'll speed us up a little bit. Um, Scenario two is just making, we're gonna go back to assuming the local effort rate's a dollar. But scenario two is going to assume that, okay, let's just make changes to the funding formula. This is gonna illustrate the point I was making earlier about how the funding formula uh, is actually in, irrelevant to a lot of the school districts in Nebraska. So what we've done is we've brought the local effort rate up back uh, to a dollar, but now we're doing a single base amount and you can choose the amount in the model input pa panel, or you can do a size adjustment based on rurality. That's currently not in this scenario. Single base amount of $8,400. There is a poverty weight of 0.2, so a 20% weight for low income students. Uh, the special education funding is kept how it is, but then limiting uh, English learner, that weight is also at 20%. So now let's look at how the funding would be impacted. What's remarkable to me is how many districts would not be affected. If you did this range of reforms to the school uh, finance formula. Now, I, there are a lot of districts in red. I think that is because we don't have the size adjustment in this scenario. Again, remember that this is not a policy recommendation. This is just a way to start probing questions you might have about the state funding formula. Um, but this, uh, these, this range of changes in scenario two to the formula Look at how many districts are not being impacted in terms of total funding. I'll also go to the local effort rate. What we shouldn't be surprised by what we see here, we haven't changed the local effort rate. So it's there's no change for each district. Um, state equalization aid, we can take a look at um, how many districts are seeing a decrease. And it's kind of paralleling what the funding results were because it's really just state equal the state formula that's being changed and so there are going to be tweaks to state equalization aid. Okay, so what would happen if we put these two together and again I would encourage anyone using the tool to start mixing and, and matching and combine thinking about both the revenue side like I was saying in my slides and the allocation side. So let's hit scenario three. So now the local effort rate is down to 75 cents again. And then we also have changes to the formula 
uh, that I was exploring earlier with scenario two. Um, that's state equalization aid. Let's go to funding. So here you are. If you combined a seventy, a decrease in local effort rate down to seventy-five cents, and some in, or some changes to the formula with a single base amount with kind of stable weights for higher need students. This is what the picture would look like. You would have 115 districts seeing an increase in funding, you would see 58 with a decrease and then 68 with no change at all. Again, that's because you have still a lot of districts that really are, the formula is still not relevant to them, even if you decrease the local effort rate down to 75 cents. Um, again, I'll stress again, these are not policy recommendations, but I would encourage users to start thinking about what kind of scenarios would you like to run yourself in this tool? This tool is live. We've published it online. Uh, we want you to be able to model any range of changes to Nebraska school finance system and start thinking about winners and losers, what increases to state funding would look like, how you balance property tax reform with potential changes to the formula, who the formula is currently serving well, who it might be leaving behind. Um, and with that, Michael, if you have, let me know if you have any questions, we can also get to Q&A pretty soon here. Yeah, let's go to Q&A because we have a couple. Um, and I know that on background, you know, Christian, could you mention, um, you mentioned a few states, who, who are a few states that have kind of taken on the, the reform? Um, in the past, and are you seeing states looking to do this, you know, in 2023 and, and going forward? What, what's the lay of the land on, on states taking on these types of school funding reforms? Right now, a lot of states are talking about doing school finance reform, and that is because a lot of states are dealing with large budget, budget surpluses. Um, so early in the pandemic, we kind of predicted that there would be more of an economic downturn during the pandemic than what actually how it actually panned out. And so what happened was you had an influx in federal relief dollars, but also state revenues generally did pretty well. And so when states have a big budget surplus, they start thinking, you know, what's our big, what's our, what's a big budget item that we can use this extra money to clean up? K through 12 education is often the single largest budget item in, in, in your state. And so there are a lot of states that are interested in doing this right now. Um, we, I, we've been approached by uh, groups in uh, Mississippi, um, New Hampshire, um, and in the past two states that have done school finance reform. Um, California is an example we always talk about. In 2013, California implemented a local control funding formula, um, which streamlined a, a pretty convoluted complex formula. The way I would characterize it was, it basically was a bunch of gift cards uh, that school districts were being sent, it converted all those gift cards that you could only spend on certain categories or certain kinds of services into a check. Um, it also came with an increase in state funding, but also an increase in flexibility at the district level. That, that's a case study we always highlight. But um, recently also Texas has done a reform. A couple of years ago, Texas did a reform that included both some uh, reforms on the revenue side, so property taxation and property uh, tax equalization or school funding equalization, but also some updates to the formula. Um, so yes, there are states are really considering this right now because of those budget surpluses. Um, one just information sharing question. Um, the slides that Reason has here, are these something that could be publicly shared, publicly available, aside from the tool, which obviously is going to be available, um, your slides, what about those? Yes, I'd be happy to share those. Okay. Um, a question from that, that kind of gets into what we were talking about on states being at different local effort rates. Uh, so the pie chart earlier on in the presentation showed the, the number of districts at different levy amounts. Is there a way to determine how many students are in, you know, I, I think you had like, just how many districts are at 50 to 75 cent? Is there a way to know how many students are in that kind of tax bracket, taxing bracket, so to speak? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. So, and in actually the local value and levy information that's published by your Department of Ed actually includes average daily membership numbers. So you could do 
the same kind of bracketing I did, bracketing uh, districts into different kind of ranges and count how many students are in each range. And, and like I mentioned, even though about two thirds of Nebraska school districts are off formula or they're totally local property tax uh, funded or almost totally, uh, those districts that are all off the formula account for only a, about one third of Nebraska's students. And so this is an important point. Um, while we are talking about a lot of districts, a lot of these districts are small and rural. Um, and so the districts that are being served by the formula that are getting state equalization aid um, are serving a majority of the state students. And that's important to keep in mind, but I do think it's created kind of a bifurcated system where you have a, a minority of districts that serve most of your students that are very much interested in how the formula is um, treating them. And then you have a lot of rural districts, which definitely serve a smaller overall proportion of the state students, but it's almost like they're in different worlds, you know, and, and I will also add a third is a huge percentage of your, it's not an insignificant percentage of your state students still. And yeah, I think that's an interesting point where um, if, if we're talking about changing the school funding formula, as you said, a bunch of these districts are like, well, we're not on it. And, and, and so yeah. it, that's not necessarily the best thing um, that you have a funding formula for the state and then a bunch of districts are just like, well, this is irrelevant to us. Um, yeah. Another question, similar line, the districts that are at the higher tax effort, um, and I think you might just answer this, the, do the, these tend to be the districts with, that are bigger districts that have a larger student population? Yes. That's right. And they also usually will have a higher needs calculation because they tend to serve your higher needs students. Um, so that's another reason is that they have higher student needs. And so their, uh, or their needs calculation is going to be higher and they're less likely to be able to cover that with local, local funds completely. Um, maybe a little bit of a tougher one for you. Is the model able to look at funding models that are more that are more reliant on property taxes like Vermont, where the minimum property tax rate for education is set at the state level? Um, yes, you could go into the model and increase the local effort rate if you'd want. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I think I've made it clear that that's, that's not the direction we think we would endorse or that we think Nebraska wants to go in. Um, but also Vermont has kind of a statewide it has a statewide property tax going on. I, I don't think that's even constitutional in Nebraska. Um, also, New Hampshire has kind of a statewide property tax rate uh, that also might be comparable. But in addition to the statewide property tax, they also have local property taxes um, outside of that statewide rate. Um, so, but I, I, Vermont is not more property tax dependent than Nebraska. Just because they have a statewide property tax rate doesn't mean they're more property tax dependent. Like I mentioned earlier, Nebraska is the third most property tax dependent state, and that's behind just New Hampshire and DC. And I, I will say on New Hampshire, you know, from the tax side is kind of an interesting state because they don't have a state income. And I think they don't have a state sales tax. So your options are the property tax or the property tax in New Hampshire. They do have a little bit of a business income tax, but that you know, that's like a corporate income tax. It's not going to generate the revenues that a, an individual income tax would generate. Um, do, let's see what else we got. So how did Indiana address school spending when they put more state money in their formula? How did they address, um, I, I think this would mean like sort of total school spending or, or perhaps at the district level, how do they address, address school spending in that case? Not sure I'm totally clear on the question. What, what happened was there was a large increase in state funding. So it wasn't a one for one trade of, of state dollars for local dollars. It was more than one state dollar being traded for local dollars. Anyone who knows about school finance reform probably knows this already, but it, it's the scenarios I was showing you, for example, it's pretty hard to do any kind of reform where a large number of your school districts are losing funds. Um, and that's, so in Indiana, there was an increase in, in a pretty sizable increase in, in education spending. Uh, but what happened was 
when more of your formula funds are coming from the state, what happens is any kind of increase to, to funding is going to be more evenly distributed to school districts. How much they're spending is not gonna vary as much uh, depending on local property wealth. And I will add, Indiana still does have a local uh, operating referenda and various other local levies, but they need to get voter approval to do that. And I wanna see if I can draw a contrast that's accurate. My memory of Indiana was they then put in a hard property tax cap. I think it was 1% for homes and then two for commercial. So yeah. you could only tax up to, in the total property tax. Um, and so they, what we're talking about here in tax terms is just a tax swap, like more comes from the state, less comes from the local. Uh, you're yeah. swapping out like where the, the revenues are coming from. And Indiana kind of capped that down, but then some other states might have increased aid to locals and they, they didn't necessarily ratchet it down and, and force locals to, to lower the property tax effort. Could you explain how different states have looked at that where they, you know, I think Indiana really kept that rate capped, but have other states gone different ways and how do policymakers approach that issue? It's important to not take for granted that when state money increases, it's going to just naturally lead to a decrease in local spending. I think the reason Indiana coupled an increase in state aid um, and an increase, and just kind of a clarification that main school budgets are fully going to be state funded for school operations. Um, implementing those caps as well was a way to ensure that there was actual property tax relief happening. So I want to stress that in, in Nebraska, increasing education funding is not uh, uh, separated from any other improvements to, to voter accountability for local property taxes. It won't necessarily lead to property tax relief. One thing I want to stress is that districts that are below that $1 local effort rate, they don't have to get voter approval when they're increasing their uh, local effort rate if they're below that dollar or even going above that dollar. Um, so, I mean, residents really are in some ways at district's mercy when it comes to when it comes to these tax decisions and states that don't have that kind of voter accountability. Um, you see inequities persist, but you also voters have little recourse. Um, and, and that I think that's one of the main issues that needs to be addressed or at least considered in Nebraska. And I know I've spoke with a lot of leaders in Nebraska who are on different sides of that issue. You know, if more money comes in from the state, ought the local property tax sort of go down by mandate? Does it have to go down or should that be left to the discretion of uh, the local school boards? And I think that what has been seen in, in, across the country is different states basically make a different decision. Like, are you prioritizing flexibility at the local level? Are you prioritizing property tax relief? Are you going to find something in the middle? And, yeah. and so that's a really important question. And you know, different states yeah. have taken different looks at how to do that. Yeah. Um, in, in Nebraska, you can also just think about maybe how valuations for various classes of property are, are adjusted. Um, that's out of my wheelhouse, but I think there's a really important conversation that needs to be happening around how uh, valuation, valuations are, are, are done and then how various kinds of property, are, how their valuations are adjusted. Well, I think we're going to get to a question about that. So okay. I'm glad you're ready for that. But first, um, what is the property tax funding on average for the equalized districts? Do you have that versus the, um, versus Okay, so in, uh, across the state, you know, 59% of the revenue comes from the property tax. What about the equalized districts? Do you know what percent of their revenue comes from the property tax? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Let's see if, I, I don't know off the top of my head, I'm trying to remember if the model might empower us to kind of take a look at that question. If you're able to, walk and chew gum, I'll give you another question. It's more philosophical, it might be more your sure. opinion. You, do you think it'd be beneficial to the state if more schools are receiving equalization aid? Do you, you know, as such, is that good for the state to have more schools on the formula? Um, it depends on the 
kind of lens you're using? Um, yes, in general, I think it is. I think it's really important for, for one, there to be a, a purpose for why a district is receiving the amount that it's receiving. I also, a bifurcated system, like I was saying earlier, where some, uh, some portion of your districts really aren't on the formula at all, and then another are, even if they're just serving very different student bodies, their interests are going to diverge a lot more, and you're going to get a lot more gridlock about where dollars are going and why they should be serving certain kinds of students. I mean, if you have a lot of districts that don't even care about how you're waiting for poverty or how you're calculating a base amount, um, that's not good. Also, in just in terms of funding fairness, um, I, it, it's not fair that school districts with more property wealth are able to um, raise a lot more funding for their kids. And if more districts are on equalization aid, um, students are being treated more fairly. Districts aren't in totally different places in terms of, say, what they can pay teachers or the quality of staff, their staffing arrangements. So um, I guess those are just a couple of things to, to keep in mind when you're asking that question of, is it good for most of your districts to be on state equalization aid? Most states have some small share of districts that are off the formula. Uh, but it is usually not even close to this number that you have in Nebraska. Yeah, I, I, I recall doing specific work in a state and there was a very small number of districts that were getting nothing from the state, but they were extremely wealthy um, in terms of, I mean, these were like the richest, some of the richest suburbs in the country, yeah. which is a different thing from being your, your property wealth being ag land versus, you know, the biggest retail centers in the Midwest kind of thing. Um, yeah. On that, I, I'm, I'm sure we could follow up on the question about um, the average amount. Oh yeah, and, and what you can do though in the tool, go back to baseline, maybe some like I'm, I'm hovering over Omaha right now. Um, what this is telling you is the formula need and then how much state equalization aid is kicking in. So it looks like, at least in Omaha, about half of the funding is coming from local property taxes. So if you hover over any district that you're interested in and you wanna ask the question of, okay, if you're getting equalization aid, how much of your funding is still coming from local property taxes? I would just encourage you to kind of do this hover over. Also, actually really quickly, let me plug that. You can download the data. Um, you can download the summary figures, um, aggregated data at the district level um, in, in any scenario that you program in. So um, you don't even necessarily have to do kind of your probing of the information on the tool itself. You can put in a scenario or not, or just download the baseline data as is and, and do some more exploring, so. And so we could follow up on that. We see that the tools are here to make that calculation. It'll be a little bit tough to make that calculation live, but like you said, in Omaha, it looks like it's about 50%. Yeah. Um, so a, a reason that we have fewer equalized schools over time in Nebraska is that ag land valuation has been increasing. And, and part of what's important here is relative, like ag land's increasing at a relative faster pace than other types of property over a certain period of time, like year to year, it could vary. But let's say over 10 years, ag land might go up this amount and maybe residential is going up this amount. And so ag land is going to be, uh, districts with ag land are gonna be more relatively property rich after that type of change in, in land valuations. Yeah. Do you think it'd be helpful to make an adjustment to ag valuations uh, to, to kind of get different results across this formula? Is that kind of outside of reasons um, pathway? I think, How do you that's think a, that? I think that's a super important conversation. And I am not a fiscal policy expert, so I'm, I'm not going to weigh and say it should be 40% or 30% or, or, or whatever. Um, but I do think that's an important conversation to be had because that is the reason that you have so many districts that is the main reason you have so many districts off the formula now. Um, it wasn't like this, you know, 15 or so years ago where this many districts were off the formula. Um, but I'd also say that um, you want to make the valuation process as uniform over, over year over year as you can. Um, I, 
I do think it's also kind of a Band-Aid solution to start thinking about just bumping adjusted valuations for ag land down because that can just be changed, right? You know, based on revenue needs or year to year. What Indiana did was they made a pretty permanent cap uh, to how various um, property uh, uh, prop types of property could be assessed and how much they could be taxed. What that will do is create less volatility um, over a period of years and how much money is coming from these sources. Well, I think that we covered my one or two questions and we had a lot of fantastic questions from the audience. Um, one more thing before we wrap here that we want to add is that we will be sharing with everyone who attended uh, a landing page with different resources that are that speak to the presentation today. And most importantly, um, that we'll be sharing with you the tool that Christian is walking through right now. The idea here is, you know, the more people that can start tinkering with the formula and, and, and having it sharpen their thoughts, the better we'll all be. Um, so that tool that Reason has put together, which we're all very grateful for, that will be getting to you all soon in your email boxes, along with a few other uh, resources from the plat landing page. Um, Christian, I, I, I'm going to give you a, a couple seconds to wrap here, but before that, I want to thank you for putting this tool together. Um, I know that Reason provides this service where it's it's very acutely needed in Nebraska. This this tool is very helpful to help frame this conversation. So I want to thank you for that, and I'll give you a, a couple seconds to wrap yourself. Thank you so much, Michael. And I, I know we're already going over time, but I'll say that we just kind of reiterate, we are available as a resource um, and we're open to any feedback on the model as well and uh, to talking to people. I mean, we work in various different states. And so uh, when, when we construct a tool like this, we do a deep dive into a state's funding system. But we also recognize that um, we can't become experts, full on experts in a state funding system in a period of months. And so we're always open to getting more insight from folks who have been looking at the formula for years. Um, and so feel free to reach out. And if you have any questions about uh, the tool or the materials that I presented earlier, I, I'm, I'm happy to, to respond to that. So thank you all. Thank you all for joining today. Thank you, Christian, for bringing your expertise. And we'll talk to you all again soon. Thank you so much.